Okay, it is 11 on the dot, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Professional Satisfaction and Practice Sustainability webinar series. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to quickly review two housekeeping items. The session will be recorded and will be available after the event. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to input them into the Q&A box. We will have time at the end of the webinar to answer many, if not all of your questions. Um, with that set up, we can go ahead and jump in. Today's speaker is Stacy Lloyd, who is the Director of Digital Health and Operations here at the American Medical Association. Um, today, Stacy will present on a review of telehealth trends, informing the future of virtual care. Stacy, thank you again for being here with us today. I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Brittany. I am going to go ahead and turn the video off so we have a clean uh, presentation this uh, morning, afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, excited to be here today to talk uh, with you guys about telehealth, um, some of the recent trends and some areas for opportunity as we think about the short and long term future of, of virtual care. Before we jump into where we're at now with telehealth, uh, I think it's helpful to understand where we were before 2020. Um, back in 2016, uh, the AMA completed some digital health research um, that aimed at understanding physicians' current use of uh, various digital health, health tools and what their key requirements for adoption were. And findings indicated that physicians were largely enthusiastic uh, about digital tools, but actually use was quite low. Um, so late last year, well, actually not last year now, um, gosh, still in 2020, um, but uh, late in 2019, we had actually repeated that study. So about three years later, and found that the use of all seven tools looked at in that study and that research had increased. However, there was still um, significant work uh, to be done to really gain kind of full spread adoption. You'll see here we saw the highest jumps in virtual visits um, or telehealth visits and remote patient monitoring uh, for management um, for monitoring and management of improved care. And however, the numbers were were very high, um, with only 28% of physicians saying they currently were using virtual video visits in practice. Um, and reminding that was you know the end of of 2019, and we ended up publishing these results. Uh, early 2020. Now let's look at where we're at um, today or uh, the latest data that we had pulled available was in the fall of 2020. This image shows the increase in the number of claims uh, from 2019 um, through um, October 2020. And uh, this spring, we saw many physicians and practices providing care solely through telehealth. Um, anecdotally, we were hearing that health systems and practices went from five to 10% um, telehealth visits to 85 to 90% telehealth visits. And it really had, you know, exploded. Of note, uh, this data um, comes from the COVID-19 Healthcare Coalition's Telehealth Impact Study, which had three parts. Um, we did a claims analysis, a physician survey, and a patient survey. Um, so more to come on that study during the presentation today, specifically, um, a lot of the findings from the physician survey itself. So how did we get here? Uh, we all know at this point, the answer to that was COVID. Um, it truly ushered in uh, an approach to digital transformation that would normally take years um, and it ended up taking you know, nearly days to weeks um, uh, when COVID hit. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's in its impact on access to medical care, telehealth really did kind of emerge as that go-to way to facilitate care in an effort to keep physicians, the care teams, and patients safe. Um, and it wasn't just the virus, virus itself that you know, created this surge in telehealth, but also a lot of the changes in policy coverage and approach to implementation that helped accelerate and expand the use of telehealth. We saw increase uh, increases in coverage across all payers um, with payment parity. Uh, we saw policies um, that loosened rules around HIPAA, um, allowing physicians to use many common video applications like Skype or um, FaceTime. 
And, um, you know, the tools and guidelines now um, that are being created now are really helping many to use telehealth um, today, uh, but will continue to really define its role, um, not only as we um, continue to experience COVID uh, across the nation, but it will also be shaping the future of, of physician practice. So I want to take a look at some of the trends today we're seeing and hearing um, specifically from the physician community largely, and I'll share some uh, best practices and some areas of opportunity um, that we're learning uh, through the time that we have um, been using telehealth over the last year. Again, this surge really, the surge in use of telehealth has really provided a unique opportunity to gather more data related to telehealth use than ever before in a fairly short amount of time. So these trends and learnings that we have um, today really can help us inform that future of virtual care. So um, first I'm gonna share a little bit uh, of the research from that COVID-19 Healthcare Coalition's telehealth impact study and specifically um, the physician survey. The survey was fielded um, by this group that includes AMA, MITRE, Mayo, the Digital Medicine Society, American Telemedicine Association, Mass Challenge Health Tech, Change Healthcare, and, and some others. We used a convenient sample approach. Um, so the survey was distributed through various networks and channels across members of the work group. The survey was open from July 13th through August 15th, 2020. And we received a total of 1,594 responses to that survey. So um, with this survey, we really aim to understand the experience and attitudes of physicians and other frontline clinicians during the pandemic, um, looking at how telehealth served clinical needs, what's working well, um, and where there still may be some challenges, um, as well as thoughts around use after the pandemic. Um, so you can kind of see some of the four um, main objectives uh, for this research as part of this group. So let's dig into some of the key findings. So we asked respondents which types of telehealth they were using um, to provide clinical care. I think no surprises here that video visits for patients in their homes um, and then telephone audio only visits were used most often. We also saw some asynchronous telehealth um, and remote patient monitoring as well. I wanted to primarily focus uh, today on some of the findings related to the impact on the quadruple aim of healthcare, which includes cost, clinical outcomes, and the experience for both physicians and clinicians and patients. Um, in terms of clinical outcomes, over 75% uh, of clinicians um, indicated that telehealth enabled them to provide quality care for COVID-19 related care, for acute care, chronic disease management, hospital and ED follow-up, care coordination, preventative care, and mental behavioral health, with 60% of clinicians reporting that telehealth improved the health of their patients. In terms of patient experience, more than 80% of respondents to the survey indicated that telehealth improved the timeliness of care for their patients with a similar percentage of clinicians sharing that their patients have reacted favorably to leveraging telehealth for care. So again, um, the survey really uh, targeted physicians, and so these responses are essentially um, what the physician is hearing from their patient. Um, we can uh, chat, or I'll share a little bit more after um, we currently have a patient survey in the field where we'll be accessing um, experiences from um, actual patients that have had telehealth visits. Related to cost, uh, respondents indicated that telehealth both improved costs of care for their patients and the financial health of their practice. And finally, we also asked a question around professional satisfaction and a majority of clinicians indicated that telehealth has improved the satisfaction in their work. So largely positive responses in terms of the impact telehealth has had um, especially given the circumstances with COVID. However, there were some uh, key barriers and challenges identified as well um, that are important to know and will be very key in addressing um, to support the long-term 
the sustainable use of telehealth. The biggest concern or barrier that respondents see in the sustained use of telehealth is if there is no or low um, reimbursement post-COVID. This further highlights you know, the need to really continue to build evidence of the positive impact telehealth can have to ensure coverage um, and parity um, and equitable payment really remains in place. Additionally, um, over 64 percent of respondents indicated that technology challenges for patients are a barrier to sustained use. Um, and perceived barriers included access to that tech, um, broadband access and internet access, as well as um, low or lack of digital literacy. And finally, 58% uh, of clinicians responding are not able to currently access their telehealth technology directly through their EHR. Um, this hints at areas of opportunity really to enhance the workflow to better support telehealth in practice. We also identified some additional areas for improvement here, including integration with other digital medicine technologies, um, you know, that could potentially augment virtual visits and a lack of technical support. These really aren't surprising given the rapid way that telehealth was implemented in many practice environments, but does really present that need to address um, these challenges for successful use moving forward. I also wanted to um, provide some additional kind of insights and, and nuggets of, of great information that came out of some of these survey results um, and really do impact the way we think about virtual care for the future. Um, adoption of telehealth and physician practices has increased dramatically and patients are now more likely to be able to access telehealth services within their existing medical home. That was not as common pre-COVID um, this was further confirmed by the survey that indicated clinicians were seeing large percentages of patients via telehealth with which they had an actual pre-existing physician-patient relationship. Allowing patients to be able to see, seek telehealth care with their existing physician really does preserve that continuity of care and will be a really important aspect of coverage that we hope to see remain in place um, especially on the private payer market beyond um, the pandemic. We also asked some specific questions around remote patient monitoring. Um, only 11% of respondents indicated that they were using RPM for patients in their home. However, over 60 or over 72 of clinicians indicated that they are interested in continuing to use telehealth for chronic care management. So we could see an increase in, in the use of RPM to augment virtual care in the very near future. In this survey too, of those using remote patient monitoring, the most commonly used tools included smartphone cameras, blood pressure cuffs, body weight scales, and pulse oximeters. Um, data is most often shared manually, either verbally over the phone or via email. So this really speaks to the need that need to address some of the technology integration as a way to support more streamlined, streamlined use of, of telehealth and additional digital medicine tools um, in the short and long term. When it comes to future use, uh, we found that a large majority of physicians feel motivated to continue to use telehealth beyond the pandemic. Um, and while I, I didn't show it necessarily here, um, respondents did indicate that they would like to continue offering telehealth specifically uh, and specifically felt it was very useful for chronic disease management, medical management, care coordination, and preventative care. So what are physicians saying? Um, we had the opportunity to have conversations with physicians through a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews um, with those that participated in a program called the Telehealth Initiative. Um, in very early uh, 2020, ahead of COVID, um, the AMA in collaboration with Texas Medical Association, Florida Medical Association, Massachusetts Medical Society and the Physicians Foundation launched the initiative aimed at supporting practices across those three states in implementing telehealth in their practices. We also 
had the opportunity to survey this group um, using a very similar survey to the one used in the coalition um, telehealth impact study uh, survey as well um, that we just talked through a little bit above. And while we had a, you know, a much smaller sample size, um, the survey results were very aligned. Um, but this opportunity to speak uh, to physicians in more detail to provide a little bit more context and understanding around their experience was really extremely helpful in documenting impact um, and then planning for future needs in terms of resources, support, and advocacy. So I wanted to share a little bit of information that we, we got from some of these conversations. Um, so physicians reported that being connected to patients via telehealth uh, allowed for um, a positive impact on health and really better health. It also offered convenience. Um, telehealth is more convenient for patients who, who work or have families. Um, access to care, so patients that had transportation challenges or schedule limitations, um, it proved very beneficial for routine and preventative checks. Um, you know, many physicians reported improved attendance at routine visits, um, better adherence um, because of that improved convenience and access. And um, we also, I mean, we've heard exponentially that no-show rates have, have certainly dropped since having telehealth as an option for uh, their visit instead of having to go um, in person. And then it helped um, with uh, patients not necessarily having to avoid or put off care. We also heard um, how telehealth has impacted physicians in their practices. Um, some of the positives included the ability to experience a wide number of applications for telehealth and see potential for future opportunities. I think this is a really big positive, right? Um, being forced to, from both the physician and the patient perspective, being forced to use um, telehealth really kind of showed and put on display the impact that it can have and the benefits that it can have. Um, which, you know, you may not do um, if you're not necessarily forced to do it that way. Um, it also helped get a deeper glimpse into patients' lives to better understand what impacts their health at home. And then it helped um, certainly practices be able to stay afloat um, throughout the pandemic. With that, uh, not all experiences um, were solely or only positive. Um, we've, we've also heard that, you know, physicians have felt less connected with their patients and there have been challenges in workflows and protocols that have been created, that have created some feelings, you know, around burnout or some feelings of burnout. Some of these reactions, you know, could be and can be linked, um, likely linked to telehealth um, in the times of COVID, but they also present an opportunity um, to really identify areas for improvement. So no surprise, um, but we do continue to hear that most physicians feel that telehealth is here to stay. I think that's uh, synonymous probably with a lot of, of the industry, but it could look a little bit different after the pandemic. Um, there's still interest in continuing to offer telehealth, but certainly, you know, um, getting back to a, a more regular cadence of, of in-person visits as well. The main drivers for keeping telehealth were largely driven by patient access and convenience. Um, especially uh, for working individuals, elderly patients, less mobile patients, um, or patients who are out of town or state. Uh, physicians do see value in being able to connect with patients a little bit more easily or more frequently as needed, depending on what their care, pl care plan calls for. Um, the future of payer policies will be uh, very crucial to future use. And Remote patient monitoring could be a next step to complement telehealth visits. So again, really um, even, even a lot of the dialogue in these one-on-one -on -one interviews was certainly aligned with the survey results as well. So while there are still challenges, I have always enjoyed and, and really loved being able to hear the experiences from these physicians that we worked with through this program as well and the impact that you know, telehealth was making on their practices and patients. I won't read all of these quotes, but I, I wanted to put them out there um, for this deck and, and feel free to, you know, 
relook at them um, later or download the deck, but these quotes really do further kind of share that positive impact telehealth can have, including, you know, increased communication, uh, more visibility inside the patient's environment instead of, you know, just the, a, a smaller number of times that they may come into the office um, each year, and then cost um, cost reductions um, for the system overall related to improve, improved outcomes. So both clinicians and patients have gotten a lot more comfortable with telehealth and um, we are seeing, you know, hospitals and clinics reopened um, at this point in time. So it's not quite the same uh, scenario that we had very early on in the pandemic. Um, and this time now has really provided an opportunity to evaluate where telehealth fits into, into the care spectrum. Um, and how it will be leveraged and used beyond the pandemic by healthcare systems, clinicians, and their patients. The telehealth, uh, the AMA's telehealth implementation playbook actually lays out a step-by-step -step process for implementing telehealth that includes best practices from idea to adoption. This was um, you know, created ahead of, ahead of the pandemic, leveraging the experiences of over 80 healthcare stakeholders, including physicians, care team members, administrative leaders, and patients. Um, with the need for more rapid implementation amid the pandemic, it wasn't possible for uh, many organizations or practices to take, to take the time to really go through that thoughtful implementation process um, but many of these best practices within this playbook still hold very true. Um, and for a sustainable long-term telehealth program, they're really worth revisiting. So some key kind of best practices um, that are kind of summarized here. Um, strategizing beyond COVID, uh, taking a few steps back, developing an actual you know, strategy for what you want to address using telehealth will ground the program beyond its use just in this kind of public health emergency scenario. Ensuring that the technology being leveraged supports a long-term sustainable program. Um, revisiting the technologies that are currently being used, looking at how they work, um, if they will be available in the future is really important. Uh, while there has been some relaxation around HIPAA enforcement, this is something that is likely to be scaled back. Um, so, you know, applications like FaceTime and Skype won't be able to be used to facilitate those visits. So it's really important to kind of prepare for what the right technology is for a practice or a health system um, before that happens um, so that there's no disruption to the program overall. Implementing a team-based approach to care versus having the physician do it all will, will definitely start to balance some of the responsibilities. Um, with many physicians, you know, initiating telehealth as a way to continue to see patients once, once their practice closed, it really led to physicians completing entire visits themselves. Um, now that there, there is that opportunity to, to be back in the clinic, um, taking the time to reevaluate the role of other members on the care team how they can support te the telehealth visit and really getting them trained will be crucial for that long-term use and success. And finally, engaging patients is important now and on an ongoing basis, um, making sure they know what to expect, um, how to use virtual visits and continuing to gather feedback um, to ensure their experience is positive will be key to um, having a successful telehealth program in the future. And, I really kind of go back to this what to expect piece um, because telehealth in, in COVID times may look different than telehealth in a normal um, care environment. And things that, you know, um, patients may have been able to access a telehealth visit for maybe isn't going to, you know, continue to be the case. And that's probably an area of opportunity we'll talk about here in a, in, in a few minutes um, is really around kind of what's the right use cases for telehealth. So I don't even know if we're currently seeing a second wave or, or what we call the situation um, that we're in now, but it, it has, um, telehealth still is a really useful tool um, for addressing the challenges with COVID, um, but 
practices being open, it's also a really good time to kind of think through some of these best practices and, and start implementing them in practice so that both physicians and patients are in a better position to continue um, to provide and receive care via telehealth services um, into the future. So the pandemic gave us a lens into how quickly um, telehealth can be scaled up. Um, and, and there's a lot of benefit in that. Um, and while there you know, are certainly some best practices, both existing and emerging um, from this increase in use, we're also uh, finding some key areas of opportunity that either still need addressed um, or additional research would be needed um, to develop recommendations or best practices around. So a few of those key areas, um, one of the areas I don't think necessarily needs a lot of additional research and I don't think is a surprise, um, but COVID certainly put the spotlight on um, the need to address barriers to receiving telehealth services, including access to technology and broadband internet um, needed to actually facilitate that virtual visit, as well as the need to address um, di lower digital literacy. If we don't, make progress in these areas, virtual care won't be able to have the impact it could have in supporting population health and health and specifically supporting access to health care for marginalized, minoritized and underserved um, populations and communities. Some additional areas for research um, and identification include the impact of telehealth on um, and virtual care on ROI. Um, and that doesn't just have to be financial. Um, that's also looking at some of our traditionally more qualitative or softer metrics. Um, but there are things like um, appointment wait times, no-show rates, readmissions, quality and safety, patient experience. Um, these are all we, telehealth can really have an impact on all of these things, but really those things are often a little bit more difficult to measure or the, the data is not as readily available. So it is really important to kind of do the research and, and put in the time um, to define what those measures of success are above and beyond just kind of the dollars and cents. There's still some work to do to be um, to figure out the exact right use cases for telehealth. Um, like I mentioned, prior to COVID, it was very minimal. During COVID, it felt like everything um, was, you know, fair game. So now it's really about looking at the impact telehealth can have on outcomes and where it's working and, and what doesn't um, to stabilize moving forward and set appropriate expectations uh, again with patients. And finally, um, this is somewhat aligned to kind of that third bullet, um, but what's the optimal mix of virtual and in-person care, especially for the management of chronic disease? Um, there's been a lot of talk about telehealth potentially um, adding costs by um, increasing utilization. And um, ultimately, you know, there should be a balance between in-person and virtual care. Um, so that's still something that we definitely need to gather some more data on and do some more research around um, before kind of making any best practice suggestions. So to wrap up, um, some final thoughts. It's been really encouraging to see that physicians across the country are largely positive regarding their experience with telehealth um, and their plans for continued use. Um, I've seen similar sentiments across the patient community as well. I think, you know, many patients do want um, to continue to have this available to them, but there's always room for improvement and the existing and anticipated barriers um, to continued use of telehealth really do present an opportunity to focus on these areas now um, to optimize telehealth with in-person care and to make it sust a sustainable way um, to provide and access care in the long term. And one really one final thought I think is important to recognize is telehealth isn't for everything or everyone, and it doesn't have to be. Um, we were thrust into a unique situation with COVID where 
Telehealth was the only option for delivering care and seeking care for a period of time. Um, as we transition back to a, a normal and a likely a very new normal, um, right, it will be a choice. And for those that want that in-person encounter or visit, they can choose it. But it's important to recognize that the value, the, it's important to recognize the value that telehealth does bring um, to the way care is delivered and to have it as an option for physicians that want to provide care virtually and for patients that want to uh, be able to access it that way. Um, maybe not just for convenience, but for other reasons um, related to their actual health. So I've included a few resources here in terms of research, telehealth resources. Um, I've also shared a link to the telehealth impact study results in their entirety. That's the link down there. Um, you'll have access to the claims analysis as well um, as, as the survey results, uh, the physician survey results right now. Um, those results actually can also be viewed by medical specialty and a, a breakdown between rural, urban, and suburban, which I think is helpful in looking at some of the data from that lens. This same group um, I mentioned a little bit earlier in my presentation is also currently fielding a patient survey and the results um, were hopefully um, being finalized in the near future and will be available sometime in the first quarter here of 2021. Um, so far, I think the latest we had was almost 2,000 um, responses, so I think we'll have a lot of really good insights from that patient survey as well. And then um, I wanted to um, share that we are going to do a um, Q&A, almost like an extended uh, Q&A from some of our telehealth uh, webinars that have been provided through this Emerging Top emerging topics series. Um, so last month, my colleagues, um, Sandy Marks and Kim Horvath did an overview of a telehealth coverage and policy for 2021 and what to expect. Um, so they will be joining me uh, February 3rd through the 5th, so the remainder of this week. Um, and anyone that has any additional questions that come up um, following this presentation, or um, if you also joined the previous one, we will be um, available uh, through the AMA's Physician Innovation Network virtual panel discussion to answer those questions um, for a few days so we can keep this conversation going. So I hope you'll join us. Um, the link's at the bottom, but we will also be including it in the follow-up email um, after this discussion as well. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, I'm gonna toss it back over to Brittany to share a few additional um, upcoming announcements for the Emerging Topics webinar series. And I think then we'll go to Q&A. Thank you, Stacey. Um, that was wonderful. Like, this is such an important topic, especially as many continue to re rely on telehealth, given our current circumstances. Um, as Stacey mentioned, we just have a few slides that we wanted to run through before the Q&A. For additional resources to support your physicians and care teams during this time, please visit the American Medical Association website. Stacy, if you could go to the next slide for me. Thank you. For additional, oh, sorry, I already said that. Uh, we thank you again for joining us today and hope that you're able to join our next webinar, which is scheduled for tomorrow at 12 p.m. Central Time. Tomorrow's webinar will feature Dr. Mark Grenewald, who will speak on No One Should Care Alone, Creating Processes for Intentional Professional Connection. Next slide, please. Thank you. For general questions or comments, um, please email the Action Labs inbox at action.labs at ama-assn.org. Finally, after concluding this webinar, you will have the opportunity to participate in a brief four question survey. We ask participants to please take two minutes to fill out the anonymous survey. Your feedback is important to us as we continue to develop future programming. Okay, now we can go ahead and transition into the Q&A. Please give us a moment to get our camera set up here. I do see a question. Um, as new low cost telehealth players emerge, for example, Teladoc, Hims and Hers, Ro, what are the threats to independent physicians and are physicians worried about it? I think that's a really great question. 
Um, uh, I think the short answer is yes, I, I do feel that phys physicians are worried about that. Um, I think if you'll um, remember back to one of the slides um, that I was talking through in terms of patients now being able to see their physicians um, via telehealth as opposed to, you know, some payers that contract directly with um, a, a, the direct to consumer um, options for telehealth. Um, that expansion um, to uh, during COVID that has allowed patients to actually see their own primary care physicians or their own kind of physicians in their medical home has been really impactful. Um, it's something that we have advocated for. Um, it's a huge reason why we actually initiated the telehealth initiative was to really help. Um, and many of the practices and uh, physicians that participated in that were from independent or smaller practices. Um, and we really wanted to help them um, set up telehealth in their practices to be able to provide that offering to their patients um, because it is a, a big piece of that is to make sure continuity of care continues. Um, so that is, you know, something that we continue to advocate for, something that we're, um, you know, a lot of our resources, uh, we want to make sure that they are um, available to the independent practices um, so that they can have those telehealth offerings for their patients in the long term. Thanks, Stacey. We do have some questions and comments in the Q&A now. Um, this comment it says that in your presentation, you mentioned Skype and FaceTime methods. Um, are you able to expand upon those other telehealth me methods that you were talking about in your presentation? Um, so I think it's basically anything that is not your standard, like for instance, there is Zoom, right, for healthcare that has, um, you know, is kind of falls into that HIPAA compliant piece. But if you use a regular Zoom account, you know, that's a little bit different. So it's really kind of any of these, um, like a Microsoft Teams even, or something, you know, like that, where it's not, it hasn't taken the steps to um, be compliant with healthcare um, requirements, essentially. Um, that's really the, that's really what's not going to potentially be available after the public health emergency. That makes, I think that makes sense. I don't, I guess I, I also don't know all of the different types of, of video technologies that people could be using um, because I might not be using, I might not use them myself. Um, but, you know, anything that is really not your typical um, uh, video capabilities that you would encounter um, as a healthcare company. Right. I think that answers the question. I think this next question aligns with that a bit. Um, this participant asks if we have a list of recommended telehealth providers or if you have any suggestions in terms of vendors. Yeah, we um, do not have a list of, of vendors. Um, we, you know, don't, we can't possibly kind of certify or um, say which vendor is better than the other. Um, but I think a really good resource to do that is talking to colleagues, um, other physicians or practices um, that are using telehealth and talking through what their experience is. Um, in the playbook, we actually have a very detailed evaluation form that you can use to actually try to make those decisions um, if you're looking at various vendors, you know, asking the right questions to make good decisions for what product you might bring into your practice. Um, I know there are some of the medical um, state associations and societies that have compiled lists of, of different vendors that a lot of their, uh, a lot of the practices or their members are using. So that's another place to go. Um, yeah, I, if I if I think of anything else, um, we'll let you know. But I think one of the biggest um, uh, pieces of feedback that I can give is really just to kind of talk amongst peers to to talk through experiences there. Thank you, Stacy. These next two questions relate directly to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first is, what types of guidance do you think uh, physicians and patients can expect to see as the pandemic ends for transitioning to more appropriate tools? More appropriate tools. And I'm assuming more appropriate telehealth tools. If this participant has follow-up 
question or can provide a little bit more guidance on that uh, would be appreciated. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure exactly from a context perspective. Um, maybe if you mean guidance on what other tools could potentially augment virtual visits, I think that's um, definitely something to come um, down the pike and how to best deliver care via telehealth and what tools will help augment those visits um, to make them you know, more impactful. I think that's a definite kind of next step and area of focus um, in, the, in the coming year. It, since we kind of had our, our first initial year of um, a lot of just figuring it out from a video visit perspective, I think, again, from that sustainable use um, thought process, you really need to make sure that you have the tools in place to make that visit um, uh, as, as successful as you can and get the information um, from the patient that you need to make the best medical decisions for care. Thanks, Stacey. This also relates to the pandemic, but it's more so in lines of insurance coverage. Um, this participant asks, as the pandemic ends, do we expect insurance providers to limit the types of telehealth they'll cover? Um, should we expect more granularity in billing? Um, I think that is a little bit of to be determined. Um, I, I would anticipate seeing the types of services to be limited in some way, um, or the types of visits you can perform via telehealth to be limited in some way, especially from a coverage perspective. Um, but I do, I do think we're still kind of working that out. And um, this is also something that may have been addressed in the policy and coverage in 2021 um, webinar. So that recording should be out there. CND um, and Kim both work in our advocacy department and are very well versed in all of the specific um, visits and codes that are available for telehealth um, right now, as well as will be um, point on uh, what, what is advocated for for future coverage and availability as well. So I would also encourage um, if, if anyone does have those policy and coverage questions um, for the future or now, uh, join us on the virtual panel discussion on PIN too, because you'll have access to both of them uh, to answer some of those questions too. Thanks, Stacey. And yeah. that webinar is available on our AMA events page. If anyone has questions in terms of accessing it, again, please reach out to the Action Labs inbox. We'd be happy to provide you with a direct link. Yeah. I'm going to shift the conversation over a little bit. Um, this next participant indicates that um, they believe training and education, both for patient and provider are critical to the success of virtual care going forward. Um, do you have any insight to how medical schools are addressing the growth in virtual care? Yes, um, that is a great question. And I think we definitely heard a lot around kind of medical students being a little bit lost in the shuffle when COVID started and, you know, not really having a way to kind of continue to engage and, and even residents too, right, in, in the virtual care that was being done, especially if, say, your physician was in their home, um, you know, seeing patients via telehealth. Um, so we, our, our AMA has um, a medical education um, program called Accel Accelerating Change in Medical Education, and they have been working a lot with their medical schools over the last year, you know, nine months to a year, um, and specifically um, addressing kind of the uh, medical student and resident approach to getting them kind of involved in the telehealth workflow um, and making sure that they're not only um, learning, but supporting physicians as they go through um, uh, implementing and using telehealth. So right now in development, and I, I don't want to overstate, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be available in Q1 too. Um, there will be similar to um, our telehealth implementation playbook, kind of similar look and feel and, and kind of um, tone. They've been working on an educator's playbook for telehealth. So that will help um, those attending physicians, those educators 
um, to be incorporating medical students and residents into their telehealth workflows, into um, their telehealth program and the clinical environment. So uh, it's kind of a how-to. Um, so that will be coming soon. And I think, you know, we maybe we can slip that into some uh, post uh, communication from this, this webinar when that does come out. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Stacy. Mm -hmm. um, the next two questions relates to the digital health implement implementation playbook. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to let our participants know that um, the PowerPoint will be available after the event, um, and the PowerPoint includes a direct link to the implementation playbook, so you'll be able to access have access to it after the event. Um, let's see here. This next question relates to the data that you presented. Um, they're not sure if it's possible, but given the sample size, um, is the survey data able to be broken down by medical specialty? Yes, it is. Um, I uh, There was like an N, I can't recall off the top of my head that we kind of, um, if there wasn't a certain N, I think it might've been like 20 responses or maybe it was 50. Here nor there, that would be clumped into other, um, but we did have a significant kind of variation in medical specialty um, responses. So that is um, available on the website to be able to filter that way um, and see the data for a specific specialty. Thanks, Stacy. It looks and like the link that to is... sorry, Britt. The link to oh, um, the link to that data is also um, on the resources. Um, slide in the PowerPoint, so. Yeah, so all of our participants will have access to that. Yep. It looks like that's the end of the questions that we have for today. As Stacy Stacy mentioned during her presentation, if you have follow-up questions that relate directly to the content of this webinar, please visit the Physician Innovation Network. Um, there will be a, an email sent to you immediately following this session that will include a direct link to that pin discussion. So you'll be able to go directly to there. Um, Stacy, thank you so much for your time and expertise today. To all of our participants, thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again at another one of our upcoming webinars.